Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Asking God for a sign seems to be a universal experience. How many of us, during a tortuous night of sleep, a bout of depression, or a serious illness, haven't begged God for a sign of his presence and love? Or what about our desperate prayers before a really big decision? Lord, give me a sign, we pray. What should I do? Where should I go? Lord, show me the way. I think that last one is even a stick song, right? If anyone remembers that band. On the surface, this request from the scribes and Pharisees in the gospel lesson seems innocent enough. They say to Jesus, teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. Okay, are they calling him teacher ironically? Bitterly? Maybe sincerely. Rabbi is, after all, a term of respect. And this group of men say to Jesus, Rabbi, we wish to see a sign from you. You know what they had in mind, right? Something like the fire pot which consumed Abraham's offerings, or the three angelic visitors to his tent. Something like Moses' snake eating the magician's snakes, or manna from heaven and quail which covered the ground, or the Red Sea and the Jordan River parting, the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire, the rock which spewed forth water, the ground opening up and consuming the grumblers, the walls of Jericho falling down, the sun which didn't set so that the Israelites could destroy their enemies, the fleece of Gideon which is wet as the ground is dry and dry as the ground is wet, the altar of Elijah consumed by God's fire atop Mount Carmel. So many signs in the Old Testament. We could go on and on and on. Time and time again, Israel saw a sign from God through a prophet. A sign that was a gift from God to confirm Israel and to strengthen Israel's weak faith. Surely, a request such as this one from the scribes and Pharisees is neither without reason nor without precedent. But how does Jesus respond to their, to their request? Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. He says, an evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign. Wait right there. How do you think the scribes and Pharisees reacted to this insinuation of Jesus that they, the ones asking Jesus for a sign, are therefore an evil and adulterous gener generation? We don't know, but they're probably speechless and shocked and definitely in denial. But this is exactly what the Lord says. An evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign. Only such a generation, which in Greek can also mean group or age of man, asks for a sign. So since these guys asked for a sign, that question or that request reveals that they are evil. That is bad, not good. And not only are they evil, but they're adulterous. So cheating, lusting, acting disloyally to their spouse. Isn't that language of adultery very interesting here? I think it's very important. Jesus doesn't say that they are evil and unlawful or evil and ignorant or evil and unbelieving. He says evil and adulterous. He uses this marital and covenantal language. Note this well because we're going to come back to it. Then what else does the Lord say after this? He says, no sign will be given to it, that is, this generation, except the sign of the prophet Jonah. What on earth does that indicate? Well, Jesus goes on and he says, For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a, the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. So this sign that Jesus is talking about is nothing less than the sign of his death after which he will be buried in the earth for three days and three nights. Just as jo Jonah sort of died when he was swallowed by the big fish, but after three days and three nights, he was spewed forth. So there's a hint here in what Jesus says of the resurrection, and it's a hint that is very poignant and powerful. 
When Jesus talks to his disciples in the Gospels, he occasionally speaks of his death and resurrection, and the disciples are almost always confused and shocked. This, in Matthew 12, is one of the rare occasions when Jesus speaks of his resurrection to his interlocutors, but it's not explicit. It's not super clear. It's actually very mysterious. It is not for them to know yet the glory of Jesus Christ's resurrection. After all, this group would mock him and curse him if he were to talk about it. So here Jesus refers to his death and resurrection in a veiled way. A veiled way with a strong application of the law. Because after all, in the story of Jonah, the men of Nineveh were heathen people. They were living in Mesopotamia and they were worshipers of false Mesopotamian deities. They were not God's chosen people. They were not Israelites. They were not Jews. They did not have Moses and the prophets. They only heard Jonah's very brief sermon, which consists in Hebrew, I think, of four words. Uh, Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. That was his sermon. And the Ninevites, after just hearing this brief sermon, repented in sackcloth and ashes. So Jesus is saying that if these heathen people repented and believed in the word of God, then what will happen to the Israelites or the Jews who possess all of the scriptures, all of the inspired writings, and are evenly directly encountering Jesus Christ in the flesh right now himself, and yet are not repenting of their evil, and are not turning away from their adultery? What will happen to them? This is a strong application of the law. More on the adultery later, again, as I said. But in addition, the Lord then gives another example in addition to uh, Jonah. It's also a bit puzzling at first. For Jesus says, the queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. What's going on here? Well, the whole story is told actually in 1 Kings chapter 10. The queen of Sheba, probably Saba, which is in southwest the southwest part of the Arabian Peninsula, an ancient kingdom called Saba or Sheba, the queen there hears of Solomon's wisdom up in Israel, and she travels up to Israel with her retinue in order to question him. The story in 1 Kings 10 mentions that Solomon answered every single question that the queen of the south posed to him so well that the queen was left breathless. That's what the text says. After she's breathless, the queen praises Solomon, compliments his entire house and his retinue, and then she says, Blessed be the Lord your God who has delighted in you and set you on the throne of Israel. Because the Lord loved Israel forever, he has made you king that you may execute justice and righteousness. Then the queen of Sheba, the queen of the south, modern-day Arabian Peninsula, she makes a ridiculously large gift of 120 talents of gold and all sorts of spices and exotic animals to Solomon, the king of Israel. 120 talents of gold is around 7,000 pounds of gold, or about 260 gold bars, which is an immense and incredible gift. The queen of Sheba functions like the Ninevites in Jesus' example. Since even she, a pagan queen from far away who worshipped false gods, still came to the Holy Land and confessed the truth of the God of heaven and made a massive sacrifice for the king and his temple, she too will rise up in judgment against this evil and adulterous generation. For she, an outsider, believed when they, the insiders, did not believe and did not repent. They, the insiders, who are supposed to be God's chosen people, reject and deny God. They deny the God of heaven and earth, the God of Abraham. But in their denial, the chosen people in Jesus' time, the first century, are also denying the one greater than Solomon. For Christ is not simply a king like Solomon was a king. He is the king of kings. He is the author of life, the Lord of lords, the word of the Father, the Son of God. He is much, much, much higher than Solomon ever could achieve For Solomon was an outline of Christ, a shadow of Christ. He was a type of Christ. But Christ is the real deal. 
and the full reality of God himself. So this brings us back to the, the question again. They say, teacher, we would like to see a sign from you. How does this request for a sign, which seems so simple and basic, why does it elicit such a severe response from Jesus? After all, don't we all ask for signs all the time? How does asking for a sign from God condemn us as being evil and adulterous? Well, think about this. Do you ever ask your most intimate friend for a sign of his or her friendship to prove that he or she is your friend? What about your spouse? Do you ever ask for a sign of your spouse's love? Do you ever say, honey, I'm not sure if you actually love me. If you love me, could you bow down to me? Or if you love me, could you do this other thing for me, do this task? Or think about your son or your daughter that you love. Do you ever look at your son or daughter and think, I doubt this person's loyalty. I'd better ask for a sign of his or her obedience to see if he or she loves me. In all these instances, that request strikes us as being very odd. Usually such a question in a marriage is a hint of marital infidelity. Usually when someone says, show me that you love me, prove it to me, or I'm going to move out, that's a sign that someone is cheating that someone is committing adultery. That's the sort of thing that people shout in television shows and unfortunately in real life. Do you love me? I don't know. You're my wife, but you need to prove it to me or I'm gonna leave you forever. That's a terrible, uh, tragic request. And in a friendship, when we ask that sort of question, prove to me that you're my friend, that's a sign of manipulation and control. And with a son or a daughter, prove to me that you love me as a son. Prove to me that you love me as a daughter. That indicates what I would say is a complete and utter breakdown of relations. And that is exactly what Jesus is telling us in this teaching. What is so awesome about this is that the bridegroom of Israel is standing in front of the scribes and Pharisees. The one who has married his people and has put up with their adultery is now five feet from them. Christ is the bridegroom. He's not there to present evidence of God's relationship to these people. He constitutes the relationship of God with his people. Jesus is sent down from the Father to gather up the people of Israel, to love them and to cherish them, to save them. Jesus is not like any other teacher who's peddling something. He's not trying to convince people and to win them over with signs. He is the icon of the Father. He is the sign of the Father's presence. And he is the sword that is the word of God. Christ came to call and to save sinners. So one does not ask him for a sign. He is the sign of God's fidelity, of God's unlimited love for his people. The greatest example of that love is in his horrible death on the cross and in his glorious resurrection three days later. Christ is risen, is risen indeed, alleluia. Like Jonah, after three days in the belly of the fish, Christ spent three days in the belly of the earth, and both men emerged from death. Like King Solomon, Jesus too will impart wisdom and give peace, not because he is the wisest of men and the most peaceful of men, but because he is the wisdom of the Father and he is the Prince of Peace. So Jesus is saying that the generation he's speaking to is adulterous because they are not honoring God as the divine spouse who calls to them and rescues them and loves them tenderly and gives himself to them fully. They are not truly listening to God's voice. If they were, they would have repented and receive Jesus. But as it stands, they are not repenting and receiving Jesus. They are suspicious of Jesus, keeping him at arm's length, and trying to make him prove his worth and his value. Truly a fascinating and a expansive text. It just gets bigger and bigger the longer we look at it. But this leaves us now today, in the present day, 2024, and it leaves our generation, all of us, because we still ask God for signs, and we still want confirmation for our beliefs. So what should we learn from this story? Well, 
As I said already, Christ is the sign. He is the bridegroom. He is Israel's husband. Christ is closer to you than, your, than you are to your spouse. He's closer to you than you are to your friend or to your child. He is closer to you than you can imagine, for he's your creator and your redeemer, the lover of your soul and your friend. Christ authored your life, and he rose for your resurrection. Christ saved you from sin, death, and the devil, and he will never leave you, nor will he forsake you. So when it comes to asking God for a sign or joining, I um, can't remember the name of the singer of Sticks, but show me, uh, show me the way, that song. When it comes to figuring out what God wants you to do in your life and if you should go for this job or that job or if God would just you know, make your alarm clock go crazy and then you would know that you need to go to the hospital. All the weird, crazy things that we try to force God to do we should keep in mind that discerning the will of the Lord is different than telling him that you want a sign from him. So understanding his will and his ways, that's different than compelling him to demonstrate and prove his existence. So if you are part of the first group trying to discern the will of the Lord, if you're struggling knowing what action you're supposed to take, even after you've prayed, even after you've made supplication, even after you've done holy reading, even after you've fasted, and you're still struggling to know what you should do, maybe you've crossed over from discernment into the realm of the scribes and Pharisees and you've started to ask God for a sign. Because, brothers and sisters, you know the will of God. The will of God is to act humbly and justly, Prophet Micah. The will of God is to serve your neighbor. The will of God is to speak the truth. The will of God is to share the reason for the hope that you have. The will of God is, as John's Gospel says, to believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior. So if you are following the will of the Lord, you do not need a sign, an outer, outward sign. The sign is Christ himself. And at that point, as Martin Luther would advise us, just go boldly and make a decision, resting in the peace and presence of Christ. In his name, amen.